Okay, I'd like to go ahead and call our meeting to order. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is a, a work session of the Cedar Rapids Community School District Board of Education. Today is Monday, April 28th. Uh, earlier today, we did recognize our outstanding building volunteers, and we appreciate all of the work that they do in our schools. We certainly can't do it alone, so thank you, thank you, thank you to each and every one of them and the other ones that perhaps were not recognized tonight but do work in our district. I'd like to go ahead and ask for a motion to call the, uh, to approve the agenda, please. Yes. I move that the agenda Monday, April 28, 2014, Board of Education meeting be approved as set forth and each item is concerned ready for discussion and or action. Is there a second, second please? Second. This is a roll call action. Director Ann Hall. Aye. Director Humbles. Aye. Director Witt. Aye. Director Laverty. Aye. Director Westerkamp. Aye. Director Rosenthal. Aye. President Meisterling. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to go ahead and hold a public hearing. I'm actually going to put three public hearings together. And Laurel, I ask at this time if anyone has submitted anything in writing or via phone regarding these issues. I have no written requirement. Thank you. Thank you. So the public hearing is now open for Jefferson High School Drive Improvements, Grant Elementary School Instructional Media Center and the 2014 ADA compliance at Jefferson, Kennedy, Washington, McKinley, and Erskine. If anyone wants to address the board at this time on these items, please step to the podium now. Seeing none, I will go ahead and close that hearing out. Next is superintendent's report. Thank you. I'm pleased to begin my report tonight by introducing some Jefferson High School National Honor Society officers, as well as their advisor, Teresa Fetketter. Uh, these uh, senior members of the group are here to speak briefly about this year's National Honor Society accomplishments, service work, and recent induction ceremony. Teresa. Thank you for allowing us to speak here the, this evening. We appreciate the opportunity. Really, my role here this evening is to introduce them and then turn it over to them so that they can present to you on their year. So with me this evening is Brenna Park, Alexa Tarrington, Alexandria McPhail, Daniel Wynn, and Trey Hill. And with that, I will let them begin. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity to speak about a National Honor Society chapter. Jefferson's NHS chapter was founded in 1957, and until 2004, the chapter remained inactive and served largely as a means of recognizing academic achievements. In 2004, the chapter was then revived into an active service organization dedicated to upholding the four pillars of NHS, scholarship, leadership, service, and character. This year, our chapter has been extremely active in our school and community. During the year, our group has participated in a wide variety of projects that include a cleanup at Oak Hill Cemetery, serving as docents at the Paramount Theater, packing boxes for the Boy Scouts Scouting for Food event at Rockwell, assisting with the Blessy Walk, and working at the Show Choir Invitational, Concession Stands, and Taft Carnival. <coughs> Smaller groups of individuals have found other ways to serve our community. On Saturday, more than 20 NHSers helped with the YMCA Healthy Kids Day, and as the spring continues, members plan to help with the Truman Carnival, the Lace Up for Learning race, and the Truman Rock and Prevention Program. This year has been a special year for NHS as we hosted our first annual, annual community leaders discussion panel. This fall, four community leaders came to Jefferson and spoke with our group members about leadership, service, college, entrepreneurship, and other meaningful topics. The leaders included Nancy Kasparic, Regional President of U.S. Bank, Les Gardner, President and CEO of Cedar Rapids Community Foundation and former President of Cornell College, Chuck Peters, CEO of Source Media, and Amanda Siren, co-founder of C Tier Studio. This event was full of rigorous discussion and thoughtful questions, and it was a very rewarding experience for our members of our group. The community leaders uh, panel discussion was a huge event for our National Honor Society as there has not been another event of the same magnitude in the history of our group. My fellow officers and I are very proud to have been a part of something so great. Uh, some great things we learned from this discussion were that for the majority, if not all the panelists, they never saw their current position in their life plans. Rather, they seized upon opportunities presented to them by devoting 
time to their educations, these leaders were well positioned to act upon the opportunities offered to them. Secondly, the panelists also inspired us to make service an even larger part of our lives. All the panelists are professional people with demanding jobs and families of their own. However, they still manage to do a lot of community service projects. Amazingly, they balance their professional and family lives with their extremely active service lives. Also, the panelists offered us some life lessons. Amanda Styron stressed the idea of following one's crazy ideas because they can produce some new and different outcomes. Lastly, in order to put this large uh, event together, teamwork was a necessity. All of the NHS members were asked to write a couple of questions for the panelists and we officers and compile these questions into categories so that as many of these questions were asked or at least discussed in some way. This event was so successful that our administration has voiced great interest in continuing this event and making it a new tradition for Jefferson High School. In general, this year's National Honor Society students have been productive and creative in arranging and planning our own community projects. Last Monday, we inducted 62 new members, and we hope that they'll continue to uphold the standards of service, leadership, in which National Honor Society is founded. We will now answer any questions that any of the board has for us. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? John? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the selection process that you go through into this organization. Well, in order to be selected to be inducted to NHS, you have a student has to have a cumulative GPA of 3.5 or above, and they must also have qualities of the four pillars of NHS, which is discussed by a board of teachers at our school. Other comments or questions? I know it, John. Well, I was just going to ask, and your motivation for doing all of these great things is, what, have former students talked to you about this, or what's, what's your personal motivations, I guess, for wanting to, to volunteer like this? It's, it's a great thing for our students. I know a lot of us are motivated to find different ways to help our school and our community. I know I personally, I find it very rewarding to see the looks on people's faces, to see that what we're doing is making an impact, and it really is. I mean, every little thing helps somebody somewhere. So I think that is part of what motivates us to do the service and to keep it up after all these years. Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, <laughs> it, it is very rewarding to do that. I, and all of us do that um, by serving on the school board, and we find it to be a very rewarding experience. So I think as you go through life, you're going to find that more and more rewarding. Uh, I know I work in the downtown community area, and I know a couple other people do here. And the, um, that community leadership panel discussion that you had was much discussed in the business community. And as, as much as you guys liked it, they all liked participating, and they just thought it was a terrific event. So I encourage you to continue to have that annually. And didn't you learn just a lot from those folks? And they're very busy in this community, too. So we <coughs> salute you. We, we salute the program, and we are just so proud of our students at Jefferson High School. And to induct 60-some new members is just a terrific statement. On, on the school's behalf. So thank you so much for coming and sharing your experiences with us tonight. And we wish you nothing but continued success in your academic and personal careers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to have the uh, uh, Jefferson uh, students here on two counts. One, they did an outstanding job of representing the school this evening and National Honor Society. But uh, secondly, at our last meeting, I introduced members of the Jefferson High School academic decathlon team who were preparing to travel to Hawaii for the national decathlon contest. That event was held April 24th and 26th, and the Jefferson team, representing the state of Iowa as the number one team in Iowa, placed fourth in Division II category, and they placed third in the very important oral super quiz. So really, uh, congratulations uh, to those team. I think anybody on the decathlon yes, team? Yes, two. Two people. Thank you. <laughs> the District Wellness Council celebrated many success, successful programs with a, a special event last week. Participants highlighted such building activities as walking school bus programs, campus gardens, running clubs, and fitness nights. 
congratulations to all of those involved in creating a culture of wellness for our school district community. Next, I'm very pleased to congratulate our Deputy Superintendent, Mary Ellen Mosk, on being named the 2014 Iowa Central Office Administrator of the Year by the School Administrators of Iowa. She has served uh, as the district's Executive Director of Preschool through 8th grade from 2002 to 2012, and then as Associate Superintendent becoming, be, <clears throat> excuse me, before becoming Deputy Superintendent last summer. Mary Ellen began her educational career as an elementary teacher in Iowa City Community Schools. In my 42 years of educational service in various communities, I rank Mary Ellen among the very best professionals with whom I've had the privilege of working. Thank you. <laughs> Continuing our success, Kennedy High School was ranked number one in the state on the U.S. News and World Report list of 2014 best high schools. The best high school rankings are available online and are compiled using enrollment, diversity data, location, school and state assessment information, and AP testing data. Schools receive a college readiness index score, which determines their rankings. Congratulations to the Kennedy Cougars. Next, many of our students we're talking trash, but just <laughs> last week. As they cleaned up, Earth Day activities took place at many of our schools, including adoptive road projects, tree plantings, which were covered by uh, some media, I believe, uh, <clears throat> campus cleanups. It's clear that our district takes great pride in our schools and our community. <clears throat> The STEM Rocks event will be held here at the ELSC tomorrow, Tuesday, April 29th. This event is being hosted by Kirkwood Community College and will be an opportunity for parents and students to learn more about science, technology, engineering, and math courses that support careers in those fields. It is a free event from 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock here at the ELSC. Finally, many of us had the opportunity just prior to this event to meet and thank some of the thousands of community members who volunteer in our schools. It's always a wonderful celebration and a tremendous level of volunteering uh, happening in our schools by the community to support our students and staff. Tonight we have a video that showcases contributions of one of those outstanding volunteers. all ages, contributed a reported 143,754 hours in support of the Cedar Rapids Community School District. This is about the same as our having paid 133 paraprofessionals to work six hours every school day. With so many individuals volunteering in our schools in so many different ways, the reasons for volunteering are almost endless. However, the key reason that most volunteer is simple, to help students be successful. School volunteers are passionate about education and about helping children. I'm proud to thank each of our Cedar Rapids Schools volunteers for their dedicated contributions of time and talent. And I am very pleased to introduce our 2014 Outstanding District Volunteer and Governor's Volunteer Award recipient, Anita Heverlow. My name is Anita Heverlow. I started about 40 years ago. Um, I started when my oldest son started school. and. Uh, it was mostly at home, uh, the music teacher, doing costumes and things. And uh, here's Renoir. Here's Gauguin. You don't want Gauguin, you want Van Gogh, right? Oh, found Van Gogh. Here we go. I walked into the art room, because I like art, and asked Miss Hauser, you know, did she need a volunteer? And she said yes. When I started volunteering in here, it gives me a creative outlet, too. You know, and she listens to a lot of my ideas. Do you want them up here? Because we're not using the big cutting board, right? Or do you want to just try and get them all back here on the table? Um, I'd rather get them all back here if we can. It's kind of fun. I enjoy working with her. And I work mostly with Lynette now. But, I mean, I've worked in the classroom. I've worked in the library. I've worked with the other special teachers. And it's, it's just, 
I just enjoy. I would say dedicated, conscientious, very helpful, um, energetic, and consistent. Anita has helped us here at Coolidge, especially in the art room. Um, she's done a lot of work with the pottery, but also with different drawings. She's helped students, but also providing just some support for Ms. Hauser. I just feel like I want to give back to the community, you know, and I, I actually went through the school system here from kindergarten through senior year, and uh, I got a good education, and I want to make sure that my grandkids, my kids, my grand, my children, my grandchildren get a, you know, get a, get everything too. Sometimes the teachers have papers that, you know, like spelling, anybody can check a spelling paper, and they need someone to read to the children. You know, there's, there's help in the library, I did that, covering books. Like in, in gym, kids need help getting skates on, um, jump rope for heart, that kind of thing. So that frees up the teacher for more classroom, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the kids and everything. So, yeah, just give it a go. Um, you may like it, you may not like it, you know, but you won't know until you try. Volunteering is huge. It really helps us a lot, but it also gives the students just that little that extra push, but it also makes them feel like they have someone that they can count on. Our um, volunteers, when they're here, whether they're here daily or whether they're here weekly, they just provide that extra little bit of support that students need. Thanks to all of our volunteers. She seems most deserving of the Governor's Volunteer Award, so congratulations to her. Uh, next are board reports. Any board reports at this time? John? I was just going to say that uh, before I came in, I saw uh, UNI Admissions was touting one of our fifth grade schools uh, visiting their campus and I know as I go around to the elementary schools a lot of our classrooms are adopting colleges and universities which is awesome and I just wanted to recognize that I think it's terrific that uh, we're exposing children at least to the concept that there's something beyond the K-12 system and also uh, to thank Kimberly Abrams um, from the school district um, she's working with Nancy's uh, office at the University of Iowa Center for Diversity and Enrichment, Admissions, College of Education, and the Bell and Blank Center. Um, with the African American Achievement Program, they have about 160 African American middle schoolers that have uh, been reading um, the book The Butler uh, with staff here in the Cedar Rapids District and at the university and will be coming down to visit on Thursday, I believe for most of the day, and meeting with current students uh, and hearing their stories and faculty stories and discussing the book. So again, just another great example of exposing students to the possibilities that are out there before them. So, um, and I know that the school district helps financially support these efforts with staff time. And so I just think that's a, a great thing to point out and, and good that we're doing it. I do too. Thank you for doing <coughs> that. Thank you. That's, that's outstanding. Any other comments or board reports? Okay, seeing none at this time, this is time for communications, delegations, and petitions. I do have a request to address the school board, Mary Arenas. And Mary, as you're ma making your way up, is, uh, you do have five minutes. This is, not <coughs> a, this is just a comment period, so the board will not be responding, but we will follow up if you have a request. Okay, we, we talk about volunteering, and I'm here to talk about um, my son, who goes to Washington High School, who is a sophomore. Um, he has done... Earth they pick up on the highway and just realize how many cigarettes there are and it takes 10 years or more for a cigarette to disintegrate. He's done Linus's blanket quilting um, blankets for the children at the university hospitals and clinics. He has worked at the Henry Davison um, back to school rallies to help with them. He donated $200 of his own money to families helping families for children who are in foster care so they could buy shoes for um, five children I believe. Um, he has done volunteering at a blood bank on Martin Luther King's birthday um, for people who are doing the blood drive. He has done shoveling for our neighbor across the street who used to be a teacher for the school district who is sick and no longer can and he does it for free. We just do community service in our home because we want to, because it's the right thing to do. So I feel that they are not selfish, all about them, 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 that we do service in our home. That's what we do and the people that are in my home, we do that also. Um, I come today for an injustice that happened at Washington High School. I was called at work and um, told my, my, my son was in the office and that he purposely tripped a girl in front of him and um, 
that I was to come get him. So I did. And I said, what happened? He said, it was an, it was an accident. And the, the um, doctor who um, is at the school, the assistant principal, talked to one person. That's her investigation was one person, the person that was next to the girl who fell. I talked to a senior who said, um, I saw what happened today. And I said, you did. Can you tell me about it? And they, she told me how she just got back from the kill a mockingbird. And my son was um, going up the stairs. He tripped into and fell on the girl in front of him. She fell. He asked, are you OK? I'm sorry. And they both kind of had a nervous laugh. And they went on. Um, only one person was investigated. And you know what that does to his self-esteem? And then we wonder why children of African-American heritage drop out of school. We wonder why people go to Marion School District or Linmar or Prairie and want charter schools. This is, some of, this is some of the reasons why. I picked him up. I took him to the counselor. I couldn't go to Virgil Gooding anymore. God rest his soul. He is deceased. But I took him to the person who would always um, sit in on there. And so he talked about what happened and, and how he felt. Um, I want to give the board, um, I just want fairness and good communication. My son was also not to be talked to because he's, um, one of the things he's affected it with is um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And when he gets questions fired off too fast, he will shut down, he won't advocate for himself, or he'll start tearing up. So I'm always to be present. I had a file, I had a paper put in his file by um, Dr. O'Malley and Somehow that got lost. It happened at Franklin that I would sit in after telling them so many times that Franklin knew, but Washington High School didn't. I just would like better communication when it comes to this. And our kids in, um, kids that have been in family foster care are twice as likely to have PTSD than our people who have served in our war, than our, than our veterans. And that's, that's a pretty high stat. Before Virgil died, um, he had talked to a Candy Lynch about doing a an in service about post traumatic stress disorder, and they did a pilot program at Harrison School, and it went great. And the teachers could understand more. I just want to give you a, a trainer, Kim Combs, who who um, teaches about PTSD and understanding traumatic stress of our children and how it affects them in the school. If somebody who does the training could please look at this, follow through with it, I think it would make a big difference in our school and our educational gap. Thank you, Mary. Next is the uh, consent agenda. Can I entertain a motion to approve? I so move. Is there a second, please? Second. Discussion on any item in consent? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. This, is a roll, this is a roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a roll call because report. of the personnel report. Yep. Director Humbles, Aye. Director Witt, Aye. Director Laverty, Aye. Director Westerkamp, Aye. Director Rosenthal, Aye. Director Anhalt, Aye. President Meisterling. Aye. Thank you. Okay, next I'm going to turn this over to Trace Pickering to talk about Innovation Education Report Initiatives. Thank you, Director Meisterling. During the last school year, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Didn't know I could be a ventriloquist. Or <coughs> Get the PowerPoint fired up here. Somebody behind the screen there. They're working on it. All right. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time tonight giving you an update on some of the innovation efforts that uh, are underway at the school district and. Uh, and some of the progress, I think uh, we have. Some, I don't think I know we have some exciting news to share with you tonight uh, about that. Um, why is innovation so critical to our overall improvement strategy? And maybe it's coming up. There we go. Uh, we're we're certainly at a crossroads uh, in our community and our country as we try to understand the hyperconnected world we live in. I know all of you that uh, work every day know know what I'm talking about and uh, the struggles it is just to try to understand what, is, what does it mean to be educated in this new world. And so trying to find new ways of making sure our kids are prepared for that world is really important. Um, the new ways are created by people who have the freedom to innovate, to try and apply, and who really live with a sense of hope, uh, possibility, and abundance. Those are the folks that make, uh, make new things happen. Uh, you heard the Jefferson students uh, refer to that as part of their work too today. 
And we can never rest on our laurels, and we have a ton of them as a district. Um, good is the enemy of great, and great is the enemy of the new. And so we always need to keep that, uh, keep that in mind that we're always looking for uh, new ways of doing things. And I, I think we're, we're doing great things in that regard. There is lots of innovation going on. Um, we have educators throughout the district every day innovating in their classrooms, on their teams. Um, and so I want to just point out a few things that are happening uh, as relates to that. Uh, we have t teachers who are constantly finding better ways to document their student learning. We have, uh, student, we have teachers making sure that students are engaged in their learning and are finding ways to personalize instruction to the best of their ability in their classrooms. Uh, they're finding ways to deal with the achievement and opportunity gaps that exist in our community. They're creating environments and communities uh, to systemically eliminate bullying and harassment. And they're finding ways to help students recognize and pursue their own passions. And so I don't want to shortchange all of the teachers in our district doing those kind of things. Um, so tonight is just a microcosm of some of the innovation, some of the very specific things that we're taking on uh, district-wide that I want to talk about. If you recall back a few months ago, our SIAC committee brought forth their recommendations related to uh, innovation in magnet schools. What's SIAC? School Improvement Advisory Committee. Thank you. Sorry. I keep forgetting I live in an acronym world. <laughs> uh, they had five recommendations for us. Uh, that we should focus on creating personalized magnetic learning experiences for all children. That we needed key design criteria to guide the design and implementation of magnet schools, which they provided us. Uh, that we needed to be relentless and constant in engaging uh, the community in conversations about our district efforts to transform. That we must continue to seed, incubate, germinate, iterate, break the mold in learning environments and innovations and create resource models that would ensure our sustainability and viability in moving those things forward. So I think you'll see evidence tonight that we've, uh, we are acting on all five of these in our work here. First, I'm gonna talk about uh, three major, four major pieces, the Iowa Big Program, the Roosevelt Option, um, the Magnet School, where we're advancing on that, and technology. The Big Ideas program, which now is, has the name Iowa Big, has been growing rapidly, moving rapidly in the last 60 days or so. Um, the vision for the Big Ideas program is a creative wide corridor program owned by the community, owned by the schools and the businesses uh, that demonstrates an unprecedented level of partnership and collaboration across the corridor to provide really new innovative kinds of learning to kids and, and help them prepare for the world they face. Uh, here's the big news. Uh, pending board approval, the College Community School District will become a full big partner next year in helping us advance this effort. Uh, this means we can put 3.0 FTE to big, uh, one and a half for us, one and a half for them, and any Cedar Rapids or College Community School student can attend big as part of their curriculum. It will be a half day program, either in the morning or the afternoon, two periods or three periods a day. Uh, students will be able to earn core academic credit through their projects and work. And we will now have the ability to connect our students to real life projects in the community uh, that benefit our businesses, organizations, and, and government entities and so forth. Uh, so big, big news uh, in this regard. We can't possibly do it alone. No school district can. Uh, this kind of, this level of community engagement and project development really requires that we, uh, that we work together in very new ways. And so this, this is very break the mold in terms of districts uh, coming together and working together. So Kirkwood has also stepped up and provided us with some funding to help build our strategic partner base, those companies and organizations who are gonna provide our kids with projects and learning opportunities and mentors uh, and support in that kind of way. Uh, we're using that, uh, those funds to help, uh, to have some people go out and help us secure those partnerships. 
Um, we are currently working to find some partners who would be willing to fund a, a director of strategic partnerships position. Uh, this is very similar to the CAPS program many of you have heard about in Kansas City. We're modeling ourselves very closely uh, with that, uh, that particular organization. Uh, so we're looking for our strategic partners out there to help fund a position that would be the liaison between the schools and the kids and the businesses, making sure we were getting meaningful, uh, deep, rich learning projects that our, our students could participate in. Uh, to give you a really quick example of what I'm talking about when I talk about projects, one of our partners is Ecolips. Uh, Steve Shriver uh, owns Ecolips in town. They make uh, lip balm that is uh, green certified. And he said one of the issues of being green certified is they still package in plastic, kind of a problem. So they invented a completely 100% cardboard um, uh, container for their lip balm. But they don't have the, the resources and the time and the expertise to do the research to find out, does it really compost? And their, their clients um, care about those kinds of things. So how long does it compost? Will it compost? Under what conditions? How long? So forth. A perfect project for the big ideas, for students in the big ideas program who can take on that research for Steve, uh, set up the compost bins, do the research, the soil testing. Does it work better with night crawlers or grubs in it or, or food waste, yard waste, all those kind of things. Be able to do that scientific research, write a report, make a recommendation to that, to that uh, company. And so not only are we helping an entrepreneur in town, we're giving students a real rich opportunity to take what they're learning in their classes about science and communication and that and applying it in a very real way with a real audience. And we've uh, just uh, inked it today. The Cedar Rapids School Foundation has agreed to act as our fiscal agent so that as we get strategic partners, they can contribute with, uh, with the full tax deduction that's uh, available to them. So that's exciting. So the goals this year for the Big Ideas program uh, we're asking each of our high schools to identify and, and help recruit 20 students from each of their schools to get things started in the fall. We have the capacity to handle up to 180, but we want to start with about, uh, you know, about 100 students, if you count uh, colleges, college communities, high school as well. We're looking to get to 100 strategic partners who provide us with mentors, projects, workshops, professional development, host our kids in real work environments, uh, and then support us uh, financially as well. We, as of about 4.30 today, had 35 signed on. So we are moving very quickly in that direction. Uh, get that funding secured. Um, one of the issues we don't want to make, we want to make sure transportation is not a barrier to being a part of BIG, and so that's part of our fundraising as well. Is can, can we find strategic partners who are willing to help us uh, purchase bus tickets, get uh, school vans paid for to get kids where they need to go. In that. And we are in the process of finalizing credit options. Uh, the University of uh, Iowa's Tippie College has approached us and they want to offer students business credit, entrepreneurial credit uh, through Iowa for projects that meet their entrepreneurial expectations. Kids will now go down and do a portfolio review. If their projects pass muster, then the students will get the credit. Uh, we're working with uh, Kirkwood to come up with similar uh, options as well. We have official public unveiling that uh, we want to talk about. On May 21st at 4 o'clock in the New Bow Market, one of our new strategic partners as of Friday, uh, we are going to have a, um, a public unveiling and a ribbon cutting of the big and the partnership between our school district and college community and hopefully 50 <coughs> or 60 partners by that time. Uh, and so we're going to invite all of, all of you as board members, administrators, the big teachers, the students and parents involved, all of our strategic partners to celebrate uh, that. The Economic Alliance will be doing a ribbon cutting. Uh, and we're going to work on holding a student and parent reception that immediately following so that uh, students and parents can learn more about big and potentially get signed up, and BIG is going to exist in the new geonetric building, which the cameras will catch in the background uh, in that event as well. And we're hoping to get tours of geonetric building, but it might be kind of a tough time to be inside the building doing lots of work at that time. 
And so more information to come on that, but definitely get that on your calendar. So that's the big ideas uh, program. We're excited about how quickly that's moving forward. But we also have uh, instituted this year the Roosevelt option, we're calling it. Uh, what is it? It's an eighth grade option for students and parents to select to have their kids involved in a fully immersed project-based uh, learning experience where they're learning their subjects in that very much a big kind of way uh, out in the community in real projects, seeing how their math connects with their English, connects with their science and history and so forth. We have three teachers, uh, 80 to 90 students they will be responsible for, teaching them the Common Core Standards and 21st Century Standards, uh, as well as dealing with community issues along the way. And tonight, I'm privileged to introduce to you Adam Cole, Lindsay Misak, and Jessica Vasquez, the three teachers who are taking on the Roosevelt option next year for us. And I'm going to let them share a little bit about what they're going to do. What do I just this next OK. okay. Well, I am Lindsay Misek. I uh, currently serve as an induction coach for Cedar Rapids. Um, but I will be coming back next year uh, to work at the Roosevelt Option. And the eight years prior to this year, I was actually at Roosevelt teaching seventh grade language arts and social studies. So um, first, I'm going to talk about how is it the same. And then my colleagues, Jess and Adam, are going to go into how is it different um, compared to what we might be seeing in our middle schools today. So first thing is the content we are still going to be hitting literacy writing science social studies and math um, including those 21st century skills that trace was talking about um, we are going to focus on the power standards as they are decided by the plc's at the forefront but we will also be hitting all standards throughout many different projects that we will be working on um, and they're going to go a little bit more into how we're going to do that uh, behavior and learning expectations are going to stay the same. Roosevelt, I believe, is in it, going to be in its fourth year of PBIS next year. Um, so we will stick with some of the PBIS things that the building has going on. But we're also going to implement some other ideas as well to help encourage kids to get out in the community. PBIS. Did I, what did I say? PBIS. What does it stand for? Oh, what is PBIS? I'm sorry. It is Positive Behavior Intervention Supports. Yes. Way to test me on that one. Thank you. Um, okay. Exploratories. Our eighth graders will still be integrated into exploratories, so they will get math, or not math, I'm sorry. They will be getting music and gym, and then the four areas of art, computer science, engineering, tech, and wellness. Um, we are working with those teachers to possibly be doing some co-teaching, though, to implement some of our projects that we are working on in the community with them as well. And then finally, we just want to make sure that we it is not an us versus them and that it is still the Roosevelt community. So um, we are looking at a similar cross-section, and we are actually going to present on Wednesday to all the seventh grade kids um, which I think we're really excited about to share with them what this program is like. But we want to keep it um, similar to what a team would be like at Roosevelt, not just the high kids, not just the low kids, but we have a very high ELL population there, and we also have a level one that we want to take into consideration as well. Um, and we will still all be involved in all school activities, as mentioned with the other things. Uh, we really want to make it an improvement on Roosevelt and not two separate schools. So with that, Adam is going to start talking a little bit about what is different. So I'm Adam Cole. I'm currently a teacher at Roosevelt. Um, I'm in a sixth grade position teaching math. Um, and I'm also part of our, uh, I'm our team leader for the sixth grade. So talking about the Roosevelt option, how is it different? Um, we will run on the same building schedule as the rest of the school, but the kids won't be transitioning to their four core areas. So actually five next year with the new setup. What I refer to when I say core is I'm talking about their math, their science, their social studies, and language arts is now gonna be broken into two separate classes, reading and writing. Those core content standards will be covered through those projects. We'll be doing some passion-driven work, finding out what do these kids want to learn about, 
uh, have them seek into that interest. And then as teachers, we're all very well immersed into the idea of standards-based grading. Uh, we will be looking at those projects and picking out what standards have they covered based upon their interest in football or based upon their interest in really wanting to change the environment at Roosevelt going green. I know there's a great group of kids in the seventh grade, um, group of kids that work with our green project uh, up in the garden. And so whatever they're going to run with, we're going to find out what have they covered academically and continue to push that. Uh, our grading, we're going to be tracking the kids' progress based upon learning standards. Uh, we're going to be covering the Iowa Core content. So when a kid uh, uh, achieves mastery, which is defined as, uh, at least in our math PLC, is three opportunities in which they've met expectations uh, def based upon the definition of the standard, that's what we'll track. The kids will be part of that tracking progress. They'll see their goals and their progress made as the year goes on. Uh, our classroom environment, Jess is going to dig into a lot uh, deep, more deeply. I believe we had handouts that we handed to the board uh, with a picture. She'll go through that. So I'll give it over to Jess. Hi, I'm Jessica Vasquez. I currently teach at Harding Middle School, but I am, oops, um, I am lucky enough to be able to get the opportunity to move over to Roosevelt for next year. My daughter did go to Roosevelt, and so that's nice to kind of be back there. And prior to Harding, I was teaching at Jefferson, so it's nice to be back on that side of town. Um, our environment, we're lucky that our environment um, and space fits our philosophy. Um, it's a really open area. The larger area you see there, we call that the community area. There'll be lots of tables where students can work um, together on projects. Along the um, bottom side there, you'll see there's individual computers where we will have modules through um, Canvas set up so the students can get um, individualized instructions through Canvas with modules. Um, in the small room, we call that our sit and get room. We will look at small groups of students who need um, direct instruction from a teacher, and those students will be taken away from the group area for a moment to get um, speci specific information that they may be missing through the individualized um, instruction with the modules on Canvas. Um, we also will have a reflection room, which will serve as a place where students can kind of go and have a time out if they need one. But we're also going to encourage the students to learn how to reflect. So they might be going into that room to do a short um, videotape of themselves about how they're doing on their project um, and how they're doing with the school. So they'll be able to reflect there. We have one more room that's not represented on here, and that will be our conference room, where we can have members of the community come in, and it will look a lot like a conference room, so the students will feel like they are um, businessmen and women and can hopefully act accordingly. Um, the biggest thing that's exciting for us is this is not just our classroom. Our classroom is the entire community. So we'll be able to allow our students to have a little more access to the community for their projects as well. <coughs> okay, thanks. Um, magnet schools. 2014-15 uh, budget uh, is going to reflect uh, the implementation of magnet schools, some funds to begin that process. Uh, we will be bringing a recommendation to the board uh, very soon, uh, asking you to designate Johnson Elementary as our first magnet school. It meets the criteria that the SIAC committee put together. Uh, it has the history and is uh, in a good position to take this challenge on and move that forward. Uh, and we are going to also uh, asked to have you consider a STEAM magnet school uh, with a bit more emphasis on the A, so it's kind of like a little smaller S-T-E-M and a little larger A. Uh, but we really, we really, after looking at the, uh, the data from the community and what we're talking about, uh, STEAM makes a lot of sense because we can't, we really can no longer artificially separate out arts and science, right? I, I look at a Mustang GT and I see lots of art in there as well as lots of technology, <laughs> right? So, so we'll be bringing that to you. Uh, so for the next year, what does that look like for us? Uh, we're going to be doing design work with Doreen Marvin, the Magnet School of America president. Uh, we are going to take uh, staff on exemplary school visits to magnet schools. There are several within driving distance of here that we can uh, go and have a chance to talk to faculty and look at facilities and curriculum and talk to parents and all kinds of things there. Uh, we are sending uh, a team in a few weeks to the National Conference on 
magnet school so that they can begin making those connections and finding out uh, what's going on across the country with that. Uh, we will invest in professional development for the staff and administration on how to teach and administer a magnet school with a STEM, uh, STEAM influence. Uh, we've built in curriculum development time for staff, uh, either added days or paying for subs <coughs> so that the staff can continue to develop curriculum uh, so that they, they own the professional development and own the curriculum writing uh, for that. Uh, there's some dollars in there you'll see for acquisition of materials and resources It might be specific to a magnet school. So for a STEAM school there might be 3D printers, there might be uh, special kinds of uh, artistic things that we need to put in place. Um, so a magnet application process. There's some uh, nice software out there that makes the uh, application for parents easy and makes the selection process completely uh, blind and random and, and fair. So we'll be looking at that. <coughs> and we'll be looking at a facility facelift and key equipment that they might need uh, in the anticipation of opening, and opening up in August of 15. So uh, a busy year ahead uh, for, for that group of folks to get that going. But we're excited about that and uh, moving that forward. The final piece I don't want us to forget about uh, is the uh, silo dollars that you earmarked last summer to help uh, spur on technology innovation in the district. And we've had uh, two rounds. We're working on our third round now. Um, Lori spearheaded the, the effort for us here. But these are a quick glance at the projects that we've funded this year you will start to see them coming to board meetings and sharing what they've learned, uh, what's working and what's not, what we should move forward and what we need to redesign and so forth. So lots of things going on uh, formally with innovation, but every day in individual classrooms as well. So with that, we'll take any questions and the three teachers can certainly come up and answer anything about the Roosevelt option as well. Questions or comments from the board? John? I'm just going to say that I'm very excited about all of these projects. I know that the board, the district administration have been working on this for a long time. You know, the teachers, I mean, giving the teachers the resources to do what they need to do. Um, one thing I want to just make, make a comment that um, I think it's critical that the parents understand some of the changes that are happening and that we communicate as best we can to the parents about the new standards-based <coughs> grading and those sorts of policies. Um, you know, I remember back in the day when we changed grading in the elementary schools and standards-based uh, grading, and it took a little while to figure all that out. But with consistent communications, parents got it, and they've, they've embraced it. And I think we need to make sure we do that at these middle and high school levels as well. I think that's been drilled in your head, hasn't it? Yeah, I've got that mm -hmm. message. <laughs> right, so, yeah. Thank no, you we, for the reminder, John. It's really nice. We've got a group of about... Um, 60 teachers, uh, 30, 35 show up at any time. We just we have a meeting at 4.30. They're, it's totally up to them if they want to come. And uh, they've been coming and helping us with the standards-based grading and you know, learning from them what works in communicating with parents, um, what's the grading skill look like, what do we have to standardize, what can teachers have flexibility on. So we're, that's getting all put together this spring. So. Great. Key? Uh, just a point of clarification. So typically the middle schools have teams, A, B, C, or whatever. So this will be essentially a team that the students will voluntarily sign up for, <coughs> meetings with parents, they see some yes and so on, and, and you'll be hopefully selecting students that there'll be enough to want to sign up to be sure it's a balanced team, correct? It, it will be balanced for sure. We've gone through the numbers, and we, um, it's very important for us to keep the same, um, same cross-section that Roosevelt currently has. So that's one thing um, we have. We know exactly how many of each type of student that we need to have. Um, we're going to be presenting to all of the seventh graders on Wednesday um, and explain to them what our program is about, and so they will have a better idea of what it will be like. Then we'll have a short application with um, just a few questions for them to fill out. Um, and then the principal has been working on, Autumn Pino has been working on working with parents as well. So That same flyer that you guys got will be going home to parents. Oops, sorry. Um, yep, the flyer that you guys got will be going home to parents as well as we are going to have a couple of parent community um, meetings where they're coming in and hearing more about the program 
And then also, um, Adam and myself are both in the building quite a bit, and we have already been talking to kids. And the reason that we have an application set up is because there's already so much interest in the program. So we're anticipating getting a lot of kids interested. We actually don't have a flyer at our, at our oh. place, so that would be great right to here. see Right here. Okay, thank you. Other comments <clears> or <throat> Anne? Um, what is the parents' role in the process? I mean, do the parents have to approve their child applying, or is this just totally up to the kids? We would like parent approval, yes. Um, the flyer that's going home, there is a link where the parents have to sign up on it, and then we're going to have paper copies as well, the kids to take home that don't have Internet access. Alan? Well, I uh, think this is great. This is exactly what we talked about, you know, reformulating the school, so great job, team thing I was wondering though is um, I know there's always these things that prevent us from doing things because like people ask me why don't we do this sooner if you are certified to teach math <coughs> license can you do the other subjects because what you're doing is you're doing multiple that was always seemed like a problem maybe middle school is not the problem maybe it's the high schools but I'm very frustrated by the fact that we can't get teachers multi-certified in multiple things and do what you're describing I'm actually certified to teach every subject in, in uh, middle school, so. I'm You're the exception, maybe. I just wanted yeah. to. Yeah, <laughs> and I yeah. can do three of the four. Yeah, so. my, my point, though, is if that becomes a, a hurdle that we have to overcome, I know we can get by that, but that was always a, a problem. The other one was the, uh, shoot, I forgot what it was, the, uh, the money, Perkins grants. We get a lot of money from Perkins for career readiness type things. I mean, is there any avenue for that? Is there a way to take the the way we do STEM now? I think is um, part time ish, you know. And I think with uh, Trace's leadership, that's going to change. But uh, especially with this new uh, coordinator that you're talking about hiring, so does that help the entire district with that? Because right now we, like I said, it's part time. We use Perkins funds here and there and everywhere, but it just doesn't feel like we've got a a strategy behind it. Yeah, uh, respond to the first question. Uh, that's why this team was selected because they represent uh, all the four discipline areas. So, as a group of students are doing a project, Adam does the assessment of their attainment of standards in math, right, and so forth. So that's that's how we're able to do that. Um, they don't have to be in a particular class per se. They just have to have a certified teacher there to validate that they're learning the math portion of that, so that's we have that. Um, in, in regard to the other, we certainly see uh, lots of this work connecting very closely to, to the STEM, um, the career readiness stuff, the big, the big program in particular is really focused on the career strands that this community needs, uh, needs to have people prepared for, so we will have projects <coughs> lined up to that. Uh, the Cedar Rapids Foundation, when we met with them last week, said uh, the, these kinds of programs are ripe for grant funding, there's money out there for these kinds of things, and they're going to help us with that, which is fantastic. So uh, I'm hopeful that we can find some external funding to really accelerate this work across the community. Nancy? Uh, I have a question, but it's not about the Roosevelt. It's about the Big Idea program. When you're saying you're recruiting 20 students from each high school, what is the process? Is there, are, are teachers nominating these students? Is how, how are these students being selected, the 20 you'd like to recruit from each uh, high school? Right. Um, it, it's, it's treated like an elective uh, class, so students have the option of, of taking it. We're, doing, um, we're trying to find ways to get connected with kids to share with them what this means, that mm -hmm. uh, if they take, take this course and do a rigorous project that can be graded on a 5.0 scale, uh, they can ach achieve some of their core credit so they don't have to worry about, am I going to have enough core credits to graduate. So we're just trying to get the, the word out to um, all different groups of kids that this is available. Uh, our best selling tool is existing students. So we're trying to find time for them to get out in our high schools and, and share their story about what they've been able to accomplish. So, One of the central uh, important points about that recruitment effort is that we have a mix of students that well represent the community that have this experience is you can't grow this kind of project. Um, well, an effective way of growing the project is through word of mouth, 
when the students feel that they tell their peers and if you exclude a group then that peer group doesn't get told that this is an option so it is very important to us to have a well representative group of students start in the big program Gary um, thank you for bringing this forward and uh, the board I'm excited about the work particularly the big project and in the expansion as we see the opportunities as we bring in more resources it'll provide more opportunities for for everyone uh, Trace I have a question about um, will there be a uh, the geometric building is there going to be a big presence in that yes the geometric building the second floor is the vault co-working space on one half and Eric Engelman is starting an accelerator program where he's helping to fund businesses uh, to come in for two or three months and try to build their business they will be on the other half uh, we will be in the vault co-working space we have office space there we can use uh, we have full use of the second floor uh, we're doing that very strategically because we want to place our students in the heart of an, our entrepreneurial community where they can see the vibrancy and the passion and excitement for creating th new things. Um, I suspect we're going to outgrow it pretty quickly, but uh, that's where we're going to get started. Excellent. Other questions or comments? Well, you've got a fully supportive board, and we're excited about this initiative. Thank you to the three of you for stepping up to uh, launch this if you will my only cautionary note is I know that we've had a similar situation in elementary called a school within a school so make sure that you're you're on guard to prevent that from happening so that these students aren't in a different school so to speak and, and <coughs> feel a sense of, of uh, uh, advantage over other students so thank you very much we look forward mm -hmm. to hearing from you next year to see how we're progressing and thank you trace for all your work on on the Big Ideas School, and, and I think it's really exciting that we're partnering with another school district. I don't, not sure that's happened in the state of Iowa before, and I know that that board is uh, is going to be hearing the same presentation. And is very excited. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. <coughs> Next, I'll turn it over to Steve and Dave for budget discussion. While uh, Steve comes up, just a couple of introductory remarks. We've been working on the. 1415 budget it seems like since the beginning of the year or even before with the uh, teacher leadership grant uh, availability as a result of legislative action from last session uh, and uh, through the support of the governor so uh, we've been working on this presentation for uh, many months uh, our ability to have the highest rated teacher leadership grant in the state and to receive that funding first year has made a significant contribution to our fiscal bottom line and this particular uh, presentation that uh, Steve Graham will present uh, that said I, I, I do want to give everybody a, a, a note that there is no budget balancing that is a, a perfect mix uh, so that uh, absolutely nobody is ever feels that their program or their interest were not harmed uh, I do want the board to know that uh, all of the teaching uh, positions uh, that are being affected uh, uh, that still are not being lost due to attrition uh, uh, those individuals for their teaching assignments will they will find homes uh, between the retirements and between the teacher leadership grant uh, positions that we were able to fill uh, we believe we have uh, 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 vacancies that we can accommodate uh, everybody and uh, they will be accommodated uh, that's uh, my personal pledge to our our faculty uh, we've been able to do that now for five years in a row and as this board knows uh, we've had some budget uh, issues over that time uh, so uh, we're uh, uh, excited about bringing this to you uh, this is a workshop so uh, this is a, a presentation of a draft of an ideas uh, we're going to try a, a, a something here when we when we finish we're going <coughs> to switch over you ready ready okay I think we're ready okay. so that we can now use our technologies to any ideas or concepts 
or comments that you're making or questions, we're going to try to capture them live on the screen and then we'll either address them uh, or we'll uh, address them uh, later in, if we have to do more research. So we want to encourage you to uh, hear the report and then we, uh, we want your feedback uh, as, as a workshop uh, setting for this uh, uh, expenditures plan. Thank you, Dr. Benson, President Meisterling, Board of Education. While we're gearing up the uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, just, uh, just on a, a bit of a personal note, um, this is never easy. And I want to let you know I'm very, very proud to serve on uh, the uh, administration and under the leadership of Dr. Benson. It has been multiple months, as he has alluded to earlier, but it has been an awesome experience from a lot of great people who have a lot of care for our school district to protect, to protect our programs and looking carefully at what our options were in regards to putting a balanced budget together. I feel very proud to serve on, uh, on this team. It's a great team and it's been a great experience. And I, I'm hoping that um, the, uh, the uh, budget adjustment cycle that we've been through over the last several years with this latest iteration will put us in a better position and with a little luck we have an enrollment growth in the future to continue uh, a, better, a better situation for all of us. So I just want you to know that uh, going into this. Um, you've, you've listened to several board meetings about the revenues budget. We certified the tax levy at our April 14th board meeting. Now we're talking about we call it the expenditures budget, but we can really call it the line item budget. This is the detail of the spending plan and the priorities of our school district. And its emphasis is on the general fund. We're not talking about any other fund. We're talking purely about the general fund. It is where our instruction takes place. So we'll go to the uh, next slide here. And um, I think the very first bullet point under guiding principles is board input, as Dr. Benson has alluded to. We value your feedback. We want to collect your feedback through this work session to get an understanding about what you're thinking about, what you're saying, what do you think about it, and what might you add to it, suggest refinement to it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is all about fiscal responsibility. It's all about transparency. And we realize we're taking the wraps off a very important element of our budget construction tonight, but we certainly value the, the input that we receive in a very transparent fashion. Uh, this is a balanced approach to budgeting. Great conversations with our senior level administrators on what we can do to promote balance while looking at making some difficult choices. And timely notice, Dr. Benson alluded to uh, the issue of personnel, and we're very happy that we are uh, in a situation that we're in from a personnel standpoint. So those are very important principles that guide us as we did the work, this very important work that we were engaged in. And now what I'm going to do, uh, uh, I guess, give you just a little context, just to serve as a reminder of why $6 million is $6 million. The forecast in the current fiscal period is for a decline of our spending authority reserves of $6 million. We began this fiscal period with a $10.5 million, give or take, a $10.5 million unspent balance or spending authority reserve. And we're forecast to bring that down to approximately $4.5 million in spending authority reserves. That's a $6 million decline. So as we're looking at building our fiscal 15 budget, we're constructing a budget with a $6 million net adjustment. So adjustment means more than just spending reductions, it means new revenues as well. And you'll see a, a nice balance of both the revenues and expenditures as well. You see that we have bullet point one, our new budget revenues and savings at approximately $6.5 million. That's more than $6 million to accommodate the new services and programs that we're providing for as a school district 
for our community in fiscal 15 that cost about a half a million dollars. And Dr. Pickering made comments about the innovative piece, which is a large component of that half a million dollar cost for new programs and services. So we're looking at a net of six million dollars in budget adjustments. New budget revenues and savings, uh, again, $6.5 million. We've got categories one, two, three, and four. And this is just a very high level summary on the PowerPoint. But as I put my glasses on and look at the fine print that we have in our document that you will have access to, and I, I believe the media has access to the document too so that they can follow along here. Our categories on the left-hand side are one through five. And one through four are those, those uh, elements of savings, elements of new revenue that provide uh, uh, financial uh, uh, relief to the general fund. The first revenue increase uh, piece, uh, number one, is really largely a result of the proposed equipment insurance breakdown program. Now, you'll hear later on tonight about the differences between what we have done. We've gone through an exercise since our last board meeting to talk about the elements of equipment breakdown repair. And you're going to find, uh, I may not have to say this later and say it now, we have a value that is lower that we've looked at as a school system that is, I will say, a less than exact science on quantifying what we could potentially have for equipment breakdown. But this is something that we've never done before. This is new science for us. Now we have Jose McFarland here from, from Specialty Underwriters out of Madison, Wisconsin, and they've done their due diligence. And you see their numbers in the board agenda. Somewhere in between these two will meet. But in terms of a budget reduction, a budget adjustment strategy, it represents on paper $479,000 as part of the overall budget adjustment strategy. Where will it be in reality at the end of the day? Uh, depending upon the wishes of the board, we may find that out through actual experience. Uh, then we also have building use, student fee increases, and uh, additional uh, revenues uh, that make up that $530,000. Item two is supplanting existing staff uh, cost. We have a number of teacher leaders in our school district that have been paid for out of our non-categorical budget. The great news is we have this new teacher leadership and compensation resource of $5.2 million. And out of the, the uh, teacher leaders that we currently provide payment to, and there's 33.9 of them, we're going to be able to transfer their costs over into our teacher <laughs> leadership grant. Therefore, a yielding as a net savings to the general fund budget. So this is a very, very good piece of, of the puzzle and uh, the great work that's been done uh, by Mary Ellen Mosk and many others uh, to put this pre uh, teacher leadership grant uh, before you. Item three is the budget. Sorry, can we ask questions along the way or do you want to wait? Absolutely. Okay. So on the teacher leadership grant, I, could you remind us how many, what, is that, um, how many years that's for? That's a three year grant uh, that we have. We, there's a three-year cycle. The state has awarded roughly one-third of all schools in the state. Cedar Rapids had the highest scoring uh, application, as Dr. Benson alluded to earlier, and uh, we will have it for the next three years for sure. And is it a fixed amount, or will it increase It's a based each upon year? a per-pupil allocation, and it's going to be tailored to enrollment. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, item three, budget expenditure savings. Uh, the, largest, uh, the largest component of that is our, our middle school instructional uh, delivery model, the revision of the instructional delivery model. That uh, represents just under $2 million of uh, budget savings uh, that we have as a district. The second uh, significant part of that is a reduction of our instructional support program of $375,000. And uh, we have reduced materials, curriculum supplies. We have uh, reduced the expenditure budgets for uh, 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 continuous improvement. And we've reduced expenditure budgets for uh, data systems. And I want to be very careful when I say reduce in these areas. We found other ways to deliver these services within the context of the budget while saving 
valuable resources in the instructional support program. In order for us to move in to the instructional support program, staffing that had been previously paid out of our non-categorical resources. So it's a way of reducing and being more efficient with our resources. We've learned a lot over the last several months. Uh, perhaps another big one here would be uh, item 4, 3.4, our anticipated higher down savings. We will yield higher down savings based upon staff turnover. It is a reality. And we've done the science on this one. This is a seven year average for all of our staff that we have in the school district. Uh, we're going uh, 3.7. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip a little bit through this. Happy to answer questions on some of the ones that I've gone but past. I have another question okay. on the higher down savings. Is yes. that, um, there's also each year and a review of the increased um, training and credentials that our staff have obtained. Is that incorporated into this? Yes, it is. This so is a net net. This is That's net. a net. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. And the reason we do the uh, rolling averages is we pick up enough high years and low years that, that we get a pretty good target. Okay. Uh, anything else? Item 3.6 is the... Uh, the uh, co-curricular schedule C positions uh, at $133,000, and that is, it represents 4.5% of the overall schedule C spending of roughly $2.5 million. So to give you a little perspective here, uh, we are looking at becoming more efficient again, once more with our transportation system by reducing four high school routes, which would represent two drivers. It's all about looking at what is the capacity? What is utilization? Are we over, uh, are, are we under utilizing our buses because we're too planful perhaps over those who may ride and end up not riding on our school buses? So we're, we're squeezing a little bit to provide more efficiency and reducing expenses in our general education high school transportation system. Custodial positions that we have, there are two FTE that we would be reducing. Uh, so. That's really a lion's share of a, of a large spending reduction uh, plan that we've got that totals $3.3 million. And we also, uh, taking a page off last year's uh, spending uh, adjustment program, we're going to planfully spend down our ISL reserves, which are estimated to be somewhere in the $1 to $1.3 million range at the end of the current fiscal year. To, again, to provide resources to uh, additional staffing that are currently paid for out of our non-categorical resources. So that really is a summary of the $6.5 million in our uh, budget revenues and savings for fiscal 15 that we've worked through. And then if we go to perhaps the next slide where the focus is on the expenditures that we will incur next year that we don't currently have in the, the budget uh, for uh, fiscal 14. So the first bullet is, uh, and Trace has provided the information on innovation. Uh, the costs are approximately a quarter of a million dollars for fiscal 15. We also have the continued <coughs> elementary Spanish program expansion next year of two FTE, two teachers. FTE is another acronym, full-time equivalent, one full-time, so two FTE, two teachers. Spanish teachers for next year. What grade and are we up to now? What grade are we up to? Fourth? Fourth grade. Fourth grade. Thank you. So there's one more year of the bump up. Got it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then finally, we had an equipment budget freeze for the current year, and we are reinstituting a part of that in fiscal 15. So we're going to have a $100,000 instructional material budget uh, for uh, our, our, basically it really helps our building, our buildings directly uh, in purchasing, having resources for the purchase of instructional equipment. So um, Excuse this me. is. Sorry, another question. Yep. Is that equipment that is not allowed to be purchased under the instructional support levy? The instructional support levy can be used to purchase any kind of equipment. So the, the, uh, there are no, there are no, the instructional support levy can be used for any general fund purpose. And uh, it was decided, determined through the work that we did in our roundtable budget setting uh, meetings to, 
to bring back out of our non-instructional support arena $100,000 while reducing $375,000 of related instructional uh, materials, equipment, supplies, et cetera. Does that answer your question, Director Rosenthal? I'm no, sure let's I try did. it again. So the $100,000, is that something that could either be on the general fund or in the instructional support levy? Yes. And, and we're choosing to put it in the general fund. I just want to make sure I understand. Yes. Okay. Yes, I think the okay. answer is yes. Okay. I, th I think you should look at this as uh, uh, we did not have a general fund support of general equipment uh, purchases this year as part of our budget strategies. And we are reinstating this at a relatively low level compared to our past expenditures. And this is, uh, this is a funded budget that is designed to cover emergencies. Okay. Uh, if we have a principal who comes in and says, I got to split a class, I don't have uh, desks, tables, chairs, teacher desk, whatever, uh, and we don't have any in the system, we're going to go meet that need. Uh, we basically said <coughs> we were going to uh, use up our supplies and we've done that. We've pushed supplies around a year. It, it's hard not to have a this kind of budget year after year after year. Thank you. You've seen this graph before. This is, I believe, the third time that uh, I've uh, shown this. And uh, is it was always premised on a reduction adjustment. I keep saying reduction. A total adjustment, a net adjustment of $6 million for fiscal 15. So you can see that our, the gold bars, the, that is tracking the spending authority reserves. And you can see that decline that we have from 13 to 14. And that shows that, uh, that uh, uh, essentially that $6 million amount. So you can see in 15 that gold bar is a flat line <coughs> with a $6 million budget adjustment program. So we're, we're in a good place. Uh, it's a it's a two percent reserve. Uh, it is uh, it's it's. I have to tell you, I'm very pleased with the work that's been done, and uh, our forecast for our cash reserves, our fund balance cash reserves, will will bounce up to eight percent because a large element of the cash flow into the general fund are based upon non-authority dollars. The cash reserve levy brings in tax dollars but it does not come with authority attached to it, you see. That's why you see this movement up in the general fund fund balance. So that will is forecast to be at 8% at the end of fiscal 15. So those are all my comments, um, and I think this is our opportunity to listen uh, and uh, listen for your feedback. Keith? Um, one of the concerns a few years ago uh, that I heard was the middle schools took a sizable cut in staff and the high schools actually increased for a few years. And I'm, I'm just ask you to really study that hard and communicate it well to our middle school level because it, they're taking a fairly substantial cut here. Well, we've got that. <coughs> Val, do you have a... I, I, a little bit of history, yeah, I think that that it has been talked about, but and I'll let Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen speak to that. But for this year, um, we really did look at what were the needs of the students, and we didn't make cuts to programs, but we looked at the schedule. We looked at a seven-period day and decided to go to an eight-period day, which allowed for RTI, or intervention time, to happen in every single middle school, which also in, is in intervention or enrichment. So we are offering that to all schools. As well as um, we also saw a need for, and, and Adam shared this a little bit when he talked about the Roosevelt option, is the need to look at our language arts program. And we are splitting that into a language arts and a literacy for every student. In the past, we've only been targeting certain students, and we really were missing kids that still needed a lot of support with reading, a lot of support in that reading area. So that is another change that we're making. Um, we also know that that um, reduction was a reduction in their collaboration time. 
they had two full periods of collaboration time and we are going to one and that's 45 minutes a day as well as we're, then we're working with uh, administration of finding creative ways to do collaboration either before school or after school which has happened in our elementaries for a long time that before school they meet as collaborative teams so we're finding in innovative ways to do that as well so those are some of the major things um, that we wanted to make sure worked out. And I hear what you're saying. We're looking at it from what do kids need, what do students need, what does our data tell us, and these are the responses that we had. Thank you, Val. I think you did a nice job of kind of explaining what's happening this year. And, and those changes at middle school aren't just for budgetary reasons. It's, it's also um, to look at student achievement. And, and our goal with the changes that have taken place are to improve student achievement and support the work with literacy at the middle school level. I can give you a little bit of a historic view um, for the past six years with budget reductions and um, the staffing that I've been a part of. And uh, over those six years, um, the majority of the reductions have taken place at the elementary level. And um, so with that, some of it was with specials and um, look, making sure that we were uh, being fiscally responsible with the use of our specials teachers. And then as we had declining enrollment, it just makes sense that we would um, lose classroom teachers at that elementary level. So that was, um, that occurred over the past five years. Um, the um, reductions then for the most part at middle and high school occurred last year with some um, looking at core curricular areas and uh, those were consistent across schools. So I think that's a little bit of a historical perspective of how that's worked over the past six years, and I can't speak to anything earlier than that. Gary? Uh, I have several questions, but let's go to the middle school right now. You, you talked about we're doing some things with uh, reading literacy. Um, hasn't, if my memory serves me right, which may or may not be correct, uh, did we not have some, some gaps with math, in particular, in the middle school? Gaps in math. Both wanting to talk. Um, yes, we did have some gaps with math as well, and we are addressing that as well. <coughs> One of the things that we're currently working on is um, kind of a condensed um, or accelerated course and making sure that if we're as we're moving kids through the middle school that we're not missing any of those Iowa core standards that they need to have and so we're um, I would say aligning that just a little bit tighter um, so hopefully we can address those gaps there as well and uh, on the I serve on the directors uh, advisory committee superintendent's advisory committee we just had our, our, our meeting here uh, on Wednesday, uh, I can tell you the issue of uh, alignment of curriculum and the Iowa core standards and the assessment uh, that will ultimately uh, be required of students uh, is a very critical issue. Uh, the superintendents are very uh, concerned that our assessment tests have not been appropriately aligned and so the work that we do in aligning math curricula uh, has to be reflected in the assessment for us to get uh, anywhere close to a fair assessment of what our students are capable of doing. Uh, we don't believe that's been there uh, in the past and we are uh, 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 politely but vigorously pushing on the uh, department to assure that that next iteration of assessment tests have good alignment to standards. And Dr. Benson, then you're inferring that what we will use for the for the core assessments probably is going to be a different instrument than what we're currently using. Correct. Uh, well, even the current publisher uh, of the tests uh, are are bringing a new iteration forward this year. So uh, I, I think that's that's fair to say. Whether we stay with uh, Iowa testing service or go to another service, uh, it's fair to say that the uh, assessments in two years will look different than the assessments that we just ran through. Other questions or comments? Alan? Uh, very good presentation, Mr. Graham. Uh, 
one thing I was wondering about is the assumptions on our growth. You know, in other words, we're on, are we a 0% growing school now on these numbers? It's because I know that affects our unspent balance. And uh, I just wonder what assumptions were used to, uh, for the projections going forward and, and long term. Well, we certainly hope that our enrollment growth of 1.3% that we experienced last fall is the beginning of a new trend. And uh, I guess the jury may be out on that one. And we certainly have high hopes that this October's count will show another increase in enrollment. The, the budget fundamentals that you heard about tonight, the $6 million number is premised on all those fundamentals. And a key fundamental within that that is very much a part of the good news of enrollment growth is that we don't have a disparity between the rate of growth in compensation packages for staff and the rate of growth of what's called new money. Now right. it's called new state supplemental assistance. Right. Every 1% disparity between those two growth rates is $1.4 million. And if we go back just one year or two years, we look at a disparity of about 3% between our growth of revenue and our award of compensation. Our scorecard, we call it the budget scorecard, this, this plan that you saw could have had an element of 1.4 million times X for the, dis the difference between enrollment growth and our growth of compensation, you see. So enrollment is a key factor and a very good news situation for us that kept it down to $6 million. Uh, actually, uh, yeah. uh, let me amplify that by simply saying uh, uh, this is based on uh, a flat uh, student count uh, from this year to next. If we get growth, that's, that's a good uh, uh, thing. And the second thing I would say is that uh, our demographer uh, originally uh, forecast that we would start turning the corner uh, post-flood era uh, next year we would start to see some um, slight uh, growth. We would start turning it around. So we actually saw it uh, a year early, uh, and I have been uh, very forthright in uh, attributing that to our uh, city and county uh, government and, and what they've done reg regarding uh, housing recovery. Uh, uh, so that's really been a, a help for us. So, uh, you know, we'll wait and see, but... Uh, it would be foolish for us to budget <coughs> growth and make an expenditures plan on growth. Uh, let's see what happens. And then one more question. The new money, I've lost track with the legislature. How do we know what number to use? What are we assuming? Are we assuming 4%, 6%? We have a 3.32% increase in new money in fiscal 15. Okay. So we know that number. And, uh, but going forward, we don't know, like next year at this time. We, we do not know. We're still on a wild card. We were hopeful that we might have known in the first 30 days of the legislative cycle, but there was no decision made legislatively for fiscal 16. And we were, by state law, should have known that within 30 days of the legislative cycle, but we still are waiting uh, for that. How does this happen? This seems ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> this ridiculous. <laughs> Okay, other, yes, Keith. I sent off a letter last week to some legislators, and I would suggest that other people do the same. You may want to call it allowable growth or supplemental assistance, whatever you want to call it. I think it's important that we tell our legislators it, we, we start in the fall. We're starting now for 2016, and that planning's there. So if you want to spend the money, us to spend the money wisely, we got to know where we're going. You know, we're looking at three-year budgets and all that. I encourage our audience to send la letters on this issue because it is important to us, extremely important. We can't have these programs and do them without planning. Okay. Other comments or questions, Ann? Um, so the, the last chart that you had up that shows the unspent balance, so it, if... Um, if we only would realize a $5 million savings, then our unspent balance would be about 1% or 1.5%. I mean, it would be less than 2, right? Yes. One, so whether it's 1.5 or 1, it'd be something less. That would be two. true, okay. yes. 
Gary? Um, I want to go back and talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the state funding, the grant that we received, and uh, to, to note that that is just a three-year grant. Um, if the funding does not continue after that, we are building in, um, could have a built-in problem, which would be magnified um, in, in three years without the continued support. So it isn't just, it isn't just one year, the allowable growth next, next year, we need to continue to see that legislatively we are we're receiving the funding to be able to do the kinds of things that we want to do. So we'll take it, we'll use it well, but uh, the caution is without it in three years, we'll really be in a, in a big mess. <laughs> Sure, and Gary, one of the things that uh, we, we too hope it goes beyond the three years, and we think that it's really important um, the, the way that we monitor and the way that we implement um, the teacher leadership funds with fidelity and implement those with integrity to make sure that we are going to see student achievement gains. I think that's what the state's going to be most interested in is um, not only the fact that we're building capacity with teacher leadership, across the state, but also that we're seeing gains in student achievement. And in my mind, part of me thinks, um, you know, we're implementing this year because we were fortunate enough to get the funds this year. Schools, some schools will be starting next year and some three years from now. I can't imagine when a school's in their first year of implementation that the following year they would take away those funds. Uh, that would seem Ill, not very logical. Um, but uh, we will do our best to <coughs> monitor the implementation to make sure it is done correctly. And we will do our best to monitor that student achievement. And we will monitor the student achievement and hopefully see those gains. Because I think if that, that's what it's about. And if we are seeing that, I can't imagine that the state would take away the money. The other thing I would just add is that we have been um, reducing our budgets for several years. And we, but we've still maintained a lot of those teacher leadership positions in Cedar Rapids. So it's very much been valued in our district. So um, just a couple thoughts on that. And again, I, um, I hope we see it for a long time to come. Well, and just a, a follow-up. Uh, again, we talked about assessments. And uh, I truly hope that the assessments that come forth are aligned with the core curriculum so that we will be able to show the assessment. And unfortunately, in the past, some of the assessments that were uh, held, used to be held accountable to didn't necessarily align with what the goals that we really wanted to achieve. So I hope we do a better job as we move forward. Not us, but it looks like the state imposing those things. John. I just want to say thank you to the administration because uh, I've been on here long enough and looked at this long enough that uh, you really did yeoman's work pulling this together. I know you've worked collaboratively with the Teachers Association and the employee groups in the district and you know we represent taxpayers and parents and business people and community members and uh, you know that we are going to hold you accountable for the student achievement component. We're, we're all about that. It, it's one of the top priorities of this board. So whether it's in the middle school or high school or elementary or specials or whatever it is, if it's going to hurt kids, uh, we're going to be asking lots of questions about it. So I think it's a great discussion. But I think as a board, we need to say thank you because this has not been easy. Uh, we see what's happening in other school districts around us where some major uh, negative effects are happening because of these budget reductions. And I completely agree with Keith and others that we need to be as a community all over our legislators right now um, many of us have done it. Our parents, our business people can't be afraid to say this is going to hurt our kids and our future. And so uh, just a, a little comment there on the side to make sure that people really do follow with that. It's very important. So thanks. I'm just going to add that I had occasion to have a, a rather lengthy conversation with the governor on Saturday. It's the governor we need to write to. I, I'm not so sure our legislators don't agree with us, but it's the governor who's adamant about a, a two-year budget cycle, mm -hmm. and he, he wasn't going to move off that point at all in the course of our conversation. So, and, and I think that in that case, I would just say that Linda Fandel, from what I understand, is a key person in the governor's office that needs to hear this message as well, because sometimes all of our voices don't always get through uh, without going to Linda on these things. So Linda Fandel. That's right. 
Other comments or questions regarding the budget? Uh, I just want to reiterate, thank you. Uh, it's a lot of hard work, and we are able to keep all of our programs intact, and as John said, to provide the best opportunities for all of our students. And, and it's not easy work. I know you've spent a lot of time on it, and um, I'm sure you had a couple of arguments. So uh, <laughs> as well you should. Heated discussions. So thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and move on. Move on. To resolution and participation in the Iowa School Cash Anticipatory Program. Very briefly, ICECAP is the Iowa School Cash and I believe you just said that, President Meisterling. <laughs> Sorry for repeating what you just said. Uh, we will be in a need for borrowing on a short-term basis this summer months and perhaps a little bit in the spring of 15. The ICECAP program in your board packet states that if the, uh, if the cost is appropriate, we will participate in the ISB program. On Friday, I met with Galen Hauser in Des Moines. Actually, I was there. Uh, uh, on business and uh, Galen has met our cost of issuance break-even point and so uh, good news we will be participating with the ice cap program with IASB as we currently do for the for the current fiscal year so that's really all I've got a motion to approve the resolution so moved second please second right. any discussion it's a roll call action director Witt Aye. Laverty. Aye. Director Westerkamp. Aye. Director Rosenthal. Aye. Director Anhalt. Aye. Director Humbles. Aye. President Meisterling. Aye. Okay, next we're going to look at that participation in the Equipment Breakdown Insurance Program once again. This was uh, tabled as a result of a board motion last uh, meeting. We have a recommendation to participate uh, in the Equipment Breakdown Insurance. Uh, per a, uh, a motion to table, uh, the uh, <coughs> item comes back to you in its identical form. Uh, we're bringing it back. We have some additional information based upon the uh, discussion uh, last time. And now you have seen how this program fits into our uh, budget planning. And that, uh, too, is an additional piece of information that you did not have. Uh, at your last uh, discussion. So with that, uh, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Dr. Benson. Uh, there are two new pieces of information since we last visited about this program. And uh, I'm going to be very brief uh, and, uh, and uh, relieve you of the presentation that you saw at the last board meeting and certainly be here to answer questions that you may have. The two uh, tasks that uh, you asked as a board that we would look for were, one, uh, find out what is the experience of participating schools <coughs> under the program. And the first page of the board attachment is that data. On the top half showing the 85 schools in the state of Iowa, that the premium, that, that there's a total dollar premium of $5.2 million paid by those 84 participating Iowa school districts with $3.5 million of of loss usage or a 67% return rate on those participating schools. So that is their experience. Uh, I'm going to back away a little bit from the bottom half of this and allow Jose to make comment on that. But before we bring Jose to the podium, I want to focus on the second page of the handout where the, you see two gold highlighted lines. Uh, learned a lot over the last couple of weeks and learned that, uh, is it gold in your packet? Do you see gold colors? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wasn't sure whether you got the color version or not. Um, we learned a lot. This is, a, this is not an exact science. We've never done this before. And uh, we looked at finding what we would be anticipating spending as a district, and uh, probably the most scientific component on here would be that that was contributed by Lori Bruzek in technology, who has an excellent handle on equipment breakdown repairs that would qualify under this program. A little bit less scientific are the other elements that make up that $315,000. But any way you slice it, it appears as though the number was lower than the number you saw that was presented to you two weeks ago. I sent this information to Jose and I asked Jose to, re to uh, respond to that. And his response is listed as notes B at the bottom. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back away and say the one lesson that I've learned is we have two values. We have a low value and we have a high value. 
And there is no perfect science to coming up with exactly the right value when you've never had the experience of going into a program like this. Um, that's, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to have Jose talk a little bit about the value that he's proposing or has, has submitted and then answer questions that you may have. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you to all the members of the board for hearing us again and taking the time to look at this. Uh, on the bottom part of the page that you have in front of you in regards to our Cedar Rapids usage projections, uh, we actually use the data from other UEN or uh, urban education uh, network schools in regards to that. And we actually use their claims per student rate uh, to extrapolate out for the Cedar Rapids School District. Uh, we have seen an uptick in our cost per claims, uh, about 16% this year. I have no idea what that's accumulated to. I would say it may be based upon the price of gas or the price of parts, the price of shipping or anything in regards to that. But based upon the seven, over 17,000 claims that we've processed in the previous year, that's what we've seen in regards to this year. So based upon our data, and this is sort of the broad pictures that we look at, um, as Steve mentioned, we don't know what your usage is going to be. Um, we are coming in with our best projections based upon other districts that we can find similar to yours and painting the picture of what we think it's going to be. But truthfully, the district will set its own usage rate and the district will set its own premium based upon that. Uh, the district will see how it works and how, how it uses and how its usage goes, and then the premium adjust in regards to that. After uh, reviewing the data and the data that Steve sent over, um, we sent it back to our underwriting team and had them review it, and um, we feel confident in, in the premium price and where we're at in regards to that, and we feel that uh, it's a good benchmark, a good starting point for a good program and a good relationship with the district. Questions? No questions. How about comments? Comments. Well, uh, I still have this underlying problem of spending money to save money, but I understand <coughs> given the budgets and where we're at that there's not a lot of options. And for me, it kind of explains that if we want to invest in our innovative education, it's going to cost something, and I see this as part of the trade-off. And I think, I think it's something we need to at least do for one year, maybe, maybe two. I'm not sure. Just, I mean, I think we need. I'm kind of leaning towards doing it at least for one year, and then, is this something that we would have to vote on annually, or once it's in, it would mm -hmm. just be there? It'd be an annual. So then we could. Yes, kind it's of, an annual policy. We kind <coughs> of get maybe an update yeah. every oh. so often, or something like that. And it's just, I don't know. It's not my favorite thing, but it's kind of feels like maybe it's the least of two evils. I don't know what to say. That's not the right way to say it either, but it's just um, the it, budget it, plug. It's a budget plug. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. it's a budget plug. I'd rather do that than cut music in all of our elementary schools, you know, or some other thing like that. So, yeah, Gary. Um, after reviewing and, and looking at, it, and I appreciate the work that the district has done coming forth. Um, I have, <coughs> I had uh, concerns last time when we first presented. I have even more concerns this time. Um, and I think one of the key things is that in order to receive the, the premium is a rebate on next year's. So you're locked in. We don't, we aren't guaranteed that, that rebate if we uh, uh, don't use the 65 percent, uh, it's credited over onto next year's premium. So it's uh, it, it, we're automatically almost uh, over the barrel of, of, of having to reissue or, or bite the bullet on what it is uh, or what the what the premium is. It's a high premium. Uh, I understand it's a shifting of funds, but the bottom line is it's all taxpayer money. We're taking the um, it's uh, it's levied against the management fund, which uh, again is going to be borne by the uh, by the taxpayer. It's a high rate of interest, the way I look at it, 
in order to achieve the funding. I understand the resources. We've talked about it. Uh, we're in this situation, I believe, because we're not getting adequate funding from the state. Uh, and uh, again, I just I don't think it's fiscal responsibility to to uh, to look at it. I appreciate the work, the effort uh, that's been put into it, uh, the creativity in looking at uh, trying to do it. But uh, I have great concerns. Okay. Other comments. John? I think Dr. Benson said this right off last time that if we had a choice in the matter, we wouldn't be doing this. Um, and I totally agree with what you're saying that if, if we had a choice, we wouldn't do this. This is the, the best that we can do at the moment. And I think that, uh, you know, we take a gamble every time uh, the legislature meets, whether they're going to adequately fund education in Iowa or not, or whether or not a flood hits and we have appropriate reserves and things in place. So uh, for me, uh, this is what we need to do to get it balanced. Um, I'm not in favor of cutting programs. We've seen uh, what can happen with that in other districts. There's no need to do that here. This is a creative solution financially in my mind to make it happen. It will cost a little bit uh, to the taxpayers to make this happen. It's a minute amount compared to our overall budget. Um, and for me right now, it's, it's the right thing to do. Okay, other comment, Nancy? I, and, and I uh, agree with John. One of the things that I don't want to happen is there's the cutting up of programs. Is it something we want to do? No, is it something we need to do? I believe it's something that we need to do. Okay. Others? Alan? I have a question, of course. The, uh, uh, we have items that are coming out of warranty. Uh, many items in this building. We're on our third year, and um, how does that handled? You know, let's say there's a piece of equipment in that room in there that needs to be replaced. I mean, there's there's some big costs there, some big risk because we don't have warranties anymore. So I just wondered, give me an example. Piece of equipment's you know fifty thousand dollars in that room goes bad. The warranty just ran out. What 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 do you do with that? Um, Great question. If the, uh, based upon the 57 categories that the district has selected, I'm assuming anything in that room is going to fall in one of those categories, it would automatically, when its warranty expires, it would automatically move on to the policy at no increase. So that's, that's factored in when we looked at, and we came and we looked at the size of the school and the spectrum of the school, those would automatically move on and we would assume that risk. Thank you. And, and just for the uh, public's uh, knowledge uh, when we constructed this building one of the uh, issues we contemplated was a standard contractor's warranty of one year or a contractor's warranty of two years and, and we went with the two-year uh, period and believe that we essentially got that free uh, in in terms of the the uh, bid market at the time we bil built this facility and so uh, we're just now coming off, as you indicated, our two-year occupancy. So uh, uh, we are facing uh, that uh, loss of contractor's warranty. Uh, but there may be manufacturer's warranties on certain components that extend beyond that. Okay. Other comments or questions? Seeing none, it is recommended the Board of Education approve participation in the Equipment Breakdown Insurance Program from specialty underwriters in fiscal year 2015. This is a voice vote. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you returning and, and providing the uh, answers to questions that we had. It helped clarify in our minds exactly what was occurring, so we appreciate your time. and. I don't know if you're driving back to Madison tonight. I, I hope safe travels for you. Thank you so much. Okay, now we're, next we're going to recognize our um, retirees through a district video. <coughs> Rapids Community School District is proud to recognize the career contributions of our retiring employees. The efforts of these teachers, support staff members, and administrators have enriched the lives of thousands of students and have strengthened the district and community. 
I am pleased to congratulate them on their accomplished careers and to thank them for their dedicated years of service. The district is pleased to congratulate Randy Necker on his 35-year career. Randy currently serves as the Associate Principal at Harding Middle School. He previously served at Wilson, Kennedy, and McKinley. When I had an opportunity to sign a contract in Cedar Rapids, I thought I had an opportunity to work for one of the best school districts in the Midwest. So I feel lucky and I feel very appreciative. The best part of my job is what I'm going to miss the most. Um, the relationships with students and parents has been special and the relationships with colleagues has been extra special. But we do have five children, all girls. They're spread out throughout the country and so obviously we want to be able to spend time with them whenever we can and I'm just looking forward to doing what I want to do when I want to do it. Uh, as simple as getting up in the morning and, and having a cup of coffee and not having to rush to get to work. The Cedar Rapids Community Schools is pleased to congratulate Anita Miller on her 16 years with the district. Anita is currently the teacher librarian at Harrison and Madison Elementary Schools. She previously served at Erskine, Johnson, Polk, and Taylor Elementaries. I will most miss the children, seeing the responses in their faces and how they react to the books that I get to read to them. The best part of my job in this district is when I first started because I got to cooperate with teachers, I got to help kids learn how to do research, hands-on research, hands-on in the computer lab to make the finished product. But the kids really learned about research, they got to do research, and they were, they learned, they were happy, they were, you know, they were happy with the results. Of course, visiting grandchildren and children in Ohio and Connecticut, I'm going to raise chickens, I'm going to take piano lessons, I'm going to garden and freeze what I garden. I'm going to make guest appearances with Mother Goose. I, I'm not going to be subbing because my round trip is like 90-some miles. I want to lead Bible studies in nursing homes. I want to read to children at the University of Iowa hospitals. That's not that far from where I live. There's just, and I want to read myself. I don't books. <laughs> the district would like to thank Donna Brudukoffer, special education and math teacher at Metro High School, for her 17 years of service to the district. I'm going to miss a relationship with staff and students at Metro and the freedom to put student needs above mandated curriculum. Over the years, the Metro Bakateria, the bike trips, Turkey Day, and all the other non-traditional things that connect kids to school and make Metro what it is. More family time, the endless possibilities that will be open to me each day. The district recognizes Dick Briggs, technical education and physical education teacher and head wrestling coach at Cedar Rapids Jefferson. Dick started his career in 1980 at Cedar Rapids, Washington, and has served 34 years in the district. Uh, the best part to me is, uh, is uh, the camaraderie between the staff and the students, and uh, you know that's one thing I'll miss about the job is the, uh, the, the, the daily uh, uh, interaction with the, with the staff and the students. I'm looking forward to not living life by the bell, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know getting to do some things that, that I want to do. I'm a skydiver, so I'm sure I'll be able to get out and get out of an airplane so the district congratulates Sue Clapp resolution team facilitator and Cedar Rapids Education Association president during her 37 years of service to the district she taught at Grant Cleveland Grant Wood Hoover and Viola Gibson elementaries the best part of my 37 year career has been getting to know and working with so many students their families and my colleagues that will also be the part I miss the most, that daily interaction with uh, the students and my colleagues who are so dedicated to great public education, uh, lifelong learning, and making a difference. I am looking forward to doing whatever I want, uh, especially uh, continuing to work with the schools as a volunteer um, and spending time with my friends, especially my Red Hat group who are all current or retired employees of Cedar Rapids Schools. Spending more time with my family, especially in my role as grandma, to Cooper, Camille, and Haley. outstanding staff that we have in our district and and Sue we're certainly going to miss you <laughs>
thank you very much. Um, I, I should have said this in the beginning of the meeting in my conversation with the governor on Saturday. He did emphasize the two-year budget cycle, but he also cautioned me that revenues are low and we shouldn't expect very much in those two years. So <laughs> I thought that was a little bit disappointing, but nonetheless, he said that. He also commended our district for the outstanding uh, grant application for the Teacher Leadership Monday money. He was uh, blown away by that, and, and it was touted across the staff about how wonderful that, that grant application was. And I can't remember what, there was one other item that he had, but I'll share that with you next time. It wasn't all that important. But anyway, good, good meeting. I, I didn't mean it quite that way. <laughs> but I said it. Um, <laughs> Uh, with that great board meeting tonight, thank you for your participation, your questions, and your interaction, and have a great meet evening. We stand adjourned. <laughs>